I am Farhan Fawad As the second assignment of the Spring 2023 Machine Learning course, I am presenting the paper titled Human Level Control Through Deep Reinforcement Learning. It was published in Nature in 2015 by a research group from Google DeepMind. This work basically started the deep learning revolution and as of today has nearly 23,000 citations. Let's take a look back at the basics of reinforcement learning. On the left, you can see a basic reinforcement learning problem. Reinforcement learning involves an agent and an environment. The agent takes an action in a given state of the environment and receives a reward based on the interaction. The objective is to train the agent to receive the maximum cumulative reward. The key function determines an agent's expected cumulative reward for a given state and action. A Q table contains Q values for all possible states and actions useful for problems with limited states. For instance, in the frozen leg problem at the bottom left, there are only 16 states and 4 actions. Implementing a Q-learning approach in, is viable for such an environment. However, for complex environments or mostly in the real-life environments, a function estimator like a neural network is more efficient than a Q-table. Neural networks are universal approximators, making them suitable for approximating the Q-values. That's where deep reinforcement learning comes in. Now let's take a look at the key contributions. Before this work, the nonlinear approximators like neural networks were unstable and often diverged during training. This paper solved two problems with that. Firstly, there was a correlation present in the sequence of observations and secondly, there was, uh, there was also a correlation between the predicted Q value and the target value. To break these correlations, this work proposed experience replay and employed a separate target network. Here are two implementation styles of deep RL. Before this work, people used the one shown on the left, which takes both state and action as input to the network requiring as many forward passes as the number of actions to determine the optimal one. The second style, shown on the right, takes only the states as input and outputs the Q values for all actions in a single forward pass. As a result, it avoids the need of multiple passes. This paper used the second approach. Here is the proposed architecture in this work. They use three convolutional layers followed by two fully connected layers. They use the ReLU activation function for all layers except the last one where they use their linear activation. Now I present some of the experimental details of this work. They evaluated 49 Atari 2600 games in this work. The same network was trained separately for each game. They used the Epsilon Grady policy to ensure a balance between exploration and exploitation. Since each game has a different reward level, they clipped them between plus one and minus one. Moreover, they used a frame skipping mechanism to tackle the flickering frame phenomena in Atari environment. This task can be considered a regression problem since action values are real numbers. Hence, they used squared error loss and RMS prop for optimization. In the equation, there are two Q functions which will be discussed in a future slide in detail. Now let's take a look at the experience replay mechanism. In RL, there is no given data. Rather, as the agent explores the environment, the experience data constituting the current state, action, reward, and the next state are stored in a buffer called replay buffer. 
During each training step, a mini batch is randomly sampled from the buffer and used for training the network. Here, random sampling breaks the correlation. This work proposed a separate target network for generating the target value which was shown in the loss equation a couple of slides back. Both the target and the prediction or policy network have the same architecture and initial weights. However, as the training progresses, the target network weights are updated in every C steps, whereas the policy network weights are updated in every training step. This delayed update ensures that the target and prediction values are not correlated anymore. Now, as a whole, the training algorithm looks like this. After initializing the replay buffer, policy, and target networks, the episode iteration starts. For every C step in the episode, at first, the agent takes a step either randomly or based on the policy network, which is determined by the epsilon greedy policy. Then the experience of that step is stored in the replay buffer. Then a mini batch is randomly sampled from the replay buffer and used to train the policy network. After C training steps, uh, the network, the target network parameters are copied from the policy network. Here are the changes in average score per episode and Q value compared to the number of epochs for Space Invaders and Sequest games. The gradual increase in the graphs represent a converging training process. The authors presented the DQN score compared to human agents in this bar chart. As the score has different ranges, they scaled it keeping the random uh, play score at 0 and an expert human play score at 100. Based on that, over 29 among 49 games show better performance by the DQN agent than by average human. Here, they showed the effects of using experience replay and separate target network in five games. As you can see, the scores increase substantially using these two methods. Now, let's take a look at a working example of the DQN agent in the game breakout. In position 1, the agent anticipates the ball is going to hit a yellow brick and hence the action value shows a spike. However, after hitting the brick, the ball needs to come down and bounce again. Hence, the dip in the value. A similar thing happens in, at position 2. In position 3 and 4, the agent gradually learns to tunnel through a corner which entails hitting lots of bricks in a single blow. This is also reflected in the high, uh, high value in the value curve. Here is another example of the game, Pong. In position 1, all three actions show similar values. However, as the ball comes down near the bat, the up action gets the most value in position 2 and 3. Immediately before scoring a point, all three actions again have the highest value indicating an upcoming reward. Here is a TSNE plot. The TSNE plot illustrated the value of the agent in different states of playing space, in, playing space invaders. At the top right and bottom left, the frames are either full of enemy ships or completely empty, indicating an upcoming batch of enemy ships. This uh, is in, indicated in the maroon color profile in the plot, which indicates the highest possible value. In the top and bottom middle plots, the value is not that high because there are more orange tanks compared to the yellow enemy ships. Uh, here, the orange tanks do not give any reward. 
Despite a disruptive performance at that time, the network failed for a few games. For example, Montezuma's Revenge is a complex game that involves sparse reward and requires a lot of exploration. In this case, the Epsilon greedy exploration technique cannot resolve this issue. In conclusion, their proposed method provides an end-to-end -end solution. Moreover, they successfully use the experience replay and a separate target network which solve the existing issues of using a neural network in the RL problems. Overall, this work provides a stable method of using deep reinforcement learning which resulted in human level performance which was never seen before. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day.